Martin Grissel is our last speaker. He's going to be talking about sublethal impacts on some of our top predators and also how to communicate some of that information to the public. Thank you. Thank you very much Chris and Emily for putting this session together. I think it, it's really refreshing to see a session that, that aims to combine just, not just reporting of the science but also outreach. You know, we've seen of course m many scientific sessions in the past and we've seen sessions that are focusing on outreach but I think merging the two is really, really important. I'm going to be talking about some of the work we're doing uh, in Recover. Recover is a government funded um, consortium. I will be showing some published uh, data from our NIDA workers and I'll point out when I, when I do that. But by and large the work I'm talking about here is, is government funded. In the consortium we work on two species mainly. We work on the red drum, a coastal species and the mahi mahi, a pelagic animal. Now the consortium consists of about 40 people. Most of them are, are shown in this picture here and as you can see it's a young, dynamic and very enthusiastic group. Uh, if you zoom in on one of these cans here you can see that the beer can here actually has a mahi on it. Uh, we did not produce this for Gomery funding uh, but, it, but, but it was our preferred choice of beverage for, for this particular meeting. Uh, I want to hide out a few people here because I'm going to be showing their data. Uh, John Stiglitz, a postdoc in the consortium over here, I'll be showing some of his work. Derek in the back here, I'll be showing some of his work and I'll also be showing some of, of Rachel's data uh, over the next few minutes. And I'd be remiss if I failed to mention Dan De Nicola. He's our outreach coordinator, uh, a constant source of inspiration and energy for, for outreach uh, efforts. In the consortium, uh, we cover a very wide range of biological levels of organization, uh, starting from molecular, cellular, and subcellular, all the way up to population level assessment. And we're also considering whether a prolonged exposure leads to acclimation or even adaptation. And I put adaptation here in quotation marks because we're actually referring to epigenetics or transgenerational acclimation, if you like. And that is occurring. I'm not going to show the data here. Uh, it is occurring, and of course, to the extent that's occurring, it will affect the impacts on all these different levels of organization as animals are exposed uh, through time and over multiple generations. Now, I mentioned I'd be showing some uh, NIDA data. I'm, I'm showing very little. These two papers here are published as a function of our NIDA efforts. Uh, and in some, on summary, what they show is what, what Jeff just discussed that is, that um, oil exposed animals certainly mahi mahi and other fish species show reduced swim performance even after brief exposures to very low levels of PAHs and certainly within what's environmentally relevant for the, the spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we've seen this on young juvenile fish and also on adult mahi and I'm going to be focusing uh, strictly on the adult mahi in this case. This type of data is collected uh, in swim tunnels. Um, I'm showing you two different versions here. We have a swim mini. This is a Lolligo produced product. Uh, Lolligo actually has an exhibit here um, and you can go see the product is sort of to the left as you enter the exhibition hall. Um, juvenile mahi as I mentioned in a swim tunnel and here a young adult mahi in a swim tunnel also a Lolligo tunnel. Now what we can do with these, in these tunnels is we can uh, gradually increase swim speed and we have defined protocols for assessing what we call aerobic performance, aerobic swim performance or sustained swimming performance in these animals. And as we are assessing their swim performance, we are also measuring their energy expense or their oxygen consumption. So in essence, this is the equivalent of a treadmill. So those of you who are on a treadmill this morning in the gym, this is, this is what it would look like for a fish. Okay? And we do, as, as Jeff showed in the, in the previous presentation, we do exercise these animals to exhaustion. So we, we get a really good feel for, war, uh, for what their capacity is. Now I mentioned that we're getting uh, metabolic rate data, oxygen consumption data as well and that allows for some really interesting considerations. This is a, this is a made up data set. Uh, this is the only made up data I'll be showing today. But what you're looking at here is oxygen consumption as a function of exercise or swim performance here. So again remember in these swim tunnels we are dictating the level of activity. And as you can see here not surprisingly as you increase swim performance here you increase the metabolic demand or the demand for oxygen uptake. And what you can get from this type of data <coughs> is, you know, at the, at the swim speed where these animals can no longer sustain position in the swim tunnel, they're maxed out. What you have is, when you look at this, this relationship here, you can extrapolate and you can get the maximal oxygen uptake. This is their absolute maximal aerobic capacity or, or aerobic performance. They cannot go any higher than this. In addition to that, uh, what you can do is if you extrapolate back to zero activity, you can get what we refer to as the basal metabolic rate. Now the basal metabolic rate for you guys is about what you exhibit right now when you're sitting doing absolutely nothing. You're not even digesting. And I'm sorry, I know I'm coming up to lunch here. 
this is something that's really difficult to measure in fish. It, it, it's so it's, it's quite often a derived value as in this particular case. This is basically the cost of just staying alive. And the difference between the cost of staying alive and the maximum oxygen uptake is what these animals have available for other activities including avoiding predation, capturing prey, spawning, performing migrations, etc. We refer to that as aerobic scope. Now the aerobic scope can be compromised in two different ways by two different types of stressors that both lead to a reduced aerobic scope. One we refer to as a limiting stress. This occurs when the maximum oxygen uptake is suppressed or reduced. It can happen in, in many different ways. Two of the most common ways and certainly two ways that are relevant for oil spills is one impairment of oxygen uptake at the gill. This happens if the gill is damaged due to contaminants or two a reduction in the delivery of blood to the gill and subsequently to the tissues that are conducing or, uh, uh, consuming oxygen. So two different ways at least in which we can have a limiting stress reducing aerobic scope. Also relevant for oil spill toxicity <coughs> no oil toxicity is what we refer to as a loading stress that basically increases the basal metabolic rate or the cost of staying alive. And uh, for, for oil toxicity uh, degradation of PAHs, induction of enzymatic systems that degrade these compounds is metabolically demanding and will tend to elevate the basal metabolic rate and thereby limit aerobic scope. So obviously if you have these stressors going on you would see a reduction in aerobic scope and possibly a reduction in swim performance as oxygen of course is important for sustained aerobic activity. We've done this work on both juvenile and adult mahi and we do see reduced swim performance in both cases and I'm going to show you uh, kind of a summary of some of the data here. This is aerobic scope. This is John's work. You can see this the, the control animals here have a very high aerobic scope. This is one of the highest measured in any tedious fish. And you can see as we increase the pH concentration here there's a collapse or reduction in this aerobic scope and it reaches statistical significance at about 8 micrograms per liter. Now if you can't deliver oxygen you would suspect that swim performance is impaired and that is indeed what we see. The swim performance at the same concentration is reduced substantially by about you know 15 to 20 percent. Uh, so this, this is significant for these animals especially for mahi I would argue because they are high performance pelagic species that really rely on high aerobic capacity and, and high swimming activity in the wild. Now the question is why is this happening? I mentioned that there's two possible or actually three possible ways to get a collapse in aerobic scope that's relevant to oil spill. One is the increase in basal metabolic rate. That's not happening here. We're not seeing a change in the basal metabolic rate. And the other is either damage at the level of the gill or uh, reduced performance of the heart uh, disabling these animals to deliver oxygen. Uh, we see no evidence of damage at the gill so we focused on the heart trying to explain this reduction in performance. And I'm now going to turn to some really exciting data that's produced by Derek. Uh, the paper is in press at the moment. Derek has a related poster on Thursday that I encourage you to go see. Now what we've done here is we've opened up a mahi. Uh, it's a little rude by some standards but uh, this animal is anesthetized. And we've fitted a transonic faux probe around the, the, the vessel that leaves from the heart leading to uh, the gill filament. So this is basically the blood moving into the gill where it's oxygenated and then back into circulation. Uh, we refer to this as the ventral aorta. And what we can do with this flow probe is we can measure not only changes in pressure but also flow in, the, in this blood vessel and it allows us to one determine uh, the heart rate and two the stroke volume which is comprised of the heart rate and um, sorry which combined with the heart rate to lead to cardiac output and from the ventricle in this case here. Now if we look at this data what you'll see on the top left here is that heart rate is preserved. There's really no effect of heart uh, on of oil exposure to on heart rate here. And again note here the concentration we th these animals have been exposed to is very very similar to the concentration that's causing a reduction in eucrit and aerobic scope. It's not because of a reduction in heart rate and that's interesting because heart rate is often assessed when you're looking for oil induced damage to cardiac function. However when you look at stroke volume this is the amount of blood that's expelled by the heart for each contraction. You can see that it's reduced by more than 40 percent. This is a massive reduction. If you experience this and you were put on a treadmill you would be in, in deep deep trouble. And of course when you multiply heart rate by the amount of blood leaving the heart for each contraction you get the cardiac output and this is what is physiologically relevant for the animal. So this impairs the ability of this animal to take up oxygen from the environment and deliver it to the exercising muscle. And again the concentration here is very very similar to the concentration where we're seeing reduced swim performance. Now we're interested in, in going a little deeper and trying to figure out why this is happening. So what I'm going to show you next is some data on isolated myocytes. So we basically disrupt these hearts enzymatically. We isolate the cells and we look at the cells uh, in isolation. 
and this is Rachel, Rachel's work. Rachel is showing a post of this also on Thursday. What you hear is, is, a, is a cardiomyocyte or a muscle cell from the heart. Um, and what we can do in this system when, when these cells are isolated is we can stimulate them electrically, which is exactly what's going on in an intact animal, and we can look at their contraction. And I'll show you a video of what that looks like. So what you're seeing here is the stimulation and the contraction of the myocyte. This, co this corresponds to the contraction of the ventricle and thereby uh, cardiac output. And we can quantify the contraction uh, through this software and, um, and, and it's actually really, really interesting. Now, let me stop this video. The data you're seeing here is, is basically the shortening of the sacromeres in these cells. So this is, this is equivalent to the ability of this heart to contract, but now at the cellular level. Uh, there's a very slight reduction in control animals over time, but it's just a few percent here. Uh, and this is just a consequence of these cells being isolated and manipulated over time. However, during that time, if the cells are exposed to oil at, at increasing concentrations, in this case, you can see that there's a dramatic reduction in their ability to contract or shorten. This explains the reduction in stroke volume and thereby cardiac output, and I believe completely explains the reduction in swim performance by these animals. So we're kind of closing the loop on this. Uh, anyway, Rachel's digging deeper to figure out why this is happening and, and it's, and I encourage you to go see her post on, on Thursday. Now, I've chosen to talk about uh, intact animals, cardiac function and then at the cellular level relating to cardiotoxicity of oil. There are many other levels of effect. We heard Emma talk about vision being impaired. You'll see much more about all this on Thursday. Uh, but cardiac function is really well suited for outreach because we all have a heart. You all hear about people with cardiac problems. You all hear about people with limitations in aerobic scope and performance. So it's something we can all relate to and that automatically makes it, makes it relevant and, and suitable for outreach activities. And we're doing a lot of different outreach activities. Emma I think gave a really good example earlier this morning. These are some of the more traditional outreach activities. And I want to echo what's been said about connecting with the community earlier in this session. And I want to point out Rachel here, she's, she's had an outreach event that we participated in at a brew pub. And you can see here how she's ga engaging with the community. <laughs> she's engaging in outreach, talking about a, a Lolligo swim tunnel, in this case, multitasking and demonstrating her ability to, to interact with the community, which of course is really, really important. Another one of my favorite outreach moments or outreach pictures here is Leela. Leela is also present in the audience here, in front of a, a, a middle school group of students here. And I mean, you, you, can, you can see, of course, that Leila is very excited here, right? But you, these kids are spellbound. And based on the feedback we're getting from these kids and their teachers, there's no doubt that we have, I mean, I, I'm, I'm tempted to say life changing effects by this outreach, but it's something that's really hard to measure, obviously. And I'll get back to that later. And this is also, this is another one of my favorite pictures, Christina. She's also f present in the audience here. And Christina is quite literally lifting this girl to a new or higher level of scientific understanding. <laughs> literally. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to show you something uh, that's perhaps a little more unusual with respect to outreach. Um, and it's trying to target a younger and so more, more modern audience. Uh, and what we're doing is we're developing an app on, that's also accessible on a computer or, or a tablet. And this is, this is Derek, our star performer here. He's, he's one of our PhD students. This is an interactive virtual lab where we're setting, assessing ability of animals to swim. So this is now Derek talking, I've muted it so, so I can talk instead, sorry Derek. And, but he's explaining what we're going to be doing in this session. Uh, we're going to choose an experimental animal, we're going to introduce the animal into an experimental chamber and you can see here there's a link to start an experiment. You saw earlier that there's links up here for lesson plans and additional information for the students. Um, the students now get to start an experiment and what this is explaining is how we're ramping up swim speed over time. And we're looking here at high exposure, low exposure and control animals and there's the failure. It, it's a little dramatic, it, you know, I, I'm sorry about that. And that's indicated right here real time and this by the way sh I should indicate is, is real data from, from uh, our earlier NRDA work. Low exposure animals struggling here and we deem that failure whereas the control is still going strong, right? Uh, to a point, even control animals of course have a limitation uh, and the Lolligo tunnels will allow us to assess what that limitation is on adults. And that's about it. That's as far as we go on that failure. And we can now see here uh, empirically the impact of the oil exposure. That's the data for, for red drum and for mahi. If you scroll over here you actually get the oxygen consumption rate and the absolute swim speed. This data can be extracted by the students for further uh, analysis where they can apply math for example to this, to this really interesting problem. There's the mahi data. 
And one thing I, I touched on earlier is the importance of assessing the impact of outreach. It's really, really difficult. But we take that very seriously. So at the end of this module, there is a, a quiz where we can assess what the impact of going through this exercise on the students is. And in fact, we're linking that to detailed demographic information that the students provide before they take this test. And I think at that point, I am going to uh, summarize and conclude. I've shown that reduced swim performance in oil exposed mahi uh, is associated with reduced oxygen uptake and collapsed aerobic scope. Uh, it has to do with a reduction in stroke volume and cardiac output, which we can explain by a reduction in the sacromere shortening of these oil-exposed animals. And I encourage you to see these, these two posters if you want more information about that particular data. Now, cardiac function and impairment is a topic that's well suited for outreach. I talked on that earlier. Uh, we, we have a lot of interest in this particular topic, so, so it's an obvious avenue to at least pursue initially. And we're now developing this app in tablet format outreach uh, virtual lab that, that we are really, really excited about um, spreading. And if you're interested in, in being part of the beta testing of this software, if you know students that, or sorry, teachers that might be interested in, in flying this by their students, feel free to contact me after this session or later during this meeting this week. Uh, we have um, a web page that I encourage you to look at. There's a lot of outreach information of that. On that, we have a Facebook page the Recover Consortium, uh, we're on Twitter, uh, and, and all these other outreach media. And, and again, this is Dan Nicola really running that. I, I wouldn't know my way around this at all if I tried. But as I mentioned, if you have questions about um, any of what we're doing, feel free to email me. That's my email address there. And with that, I'll take questions and remind you that we have a number of presentations on, on Thursday on, on this and related topics. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? I, I, I thought this was a really neat uh, outreach app. I thought that was really cool. Um, I, one thing kind of caught me there that um, you said you ask the students uh, to provide their demographic background before the assessment. There is quite a bit of evidence that reminding students of certain demographics of their demographic before assessing them affects the outcome. So I was wondering how you would take that into consideration. Well, um, I was not aware of that, so I have not taken that into consideration. I, okay. I, so I, I, I thank you for providing that information. And I guess, you know, one way around it that I can think of, and I'm really curious to hear your feedback on this, is to, uh, I guess, request the demographic information after they take the test. Yes, I, I think that would fix the problem. Ah. Great. Thanks for pointing that out. That's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so to broaden um, some of the application of your work uh, to other types of oil, is there um, any impetus to f look at different metrics of exposure other than total PAHs? So, for example, concentrations of tricyclic PAHs or any kind of a toxic unit approach? Because wouldn't it be that concentrations of TPH for this oil could be the, you know, an EC50 or whatever endpoint could be very different for a different type of oil or for a, a particular oil in a different weathering state. Yes, yeah, so, so you're opening up a, a big can of, of oil or worms, if you like, <laughs> here, obviously. Um, you know, so, so the isolated myocyte preparation I showed here is ideally suited to apply different types of, say, individual PAHs to assess some of those questions. We've done a lot of work on different oil preparations. Jeff Morris just summarized that. And uh, by just looking at the differences in composition and the different responses, you know, we've, we've gotten a lot of insight into which components in these oil mixtures mm -hmm. are, um, you know, biologically active. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but there is so much work to be done in that field. And, and I, mm -hmm. I agree with you completely that reporting everything on a total pH basis is, is crude. It's a, it's a good way to start, mm -hmm. but, but there's a lot more to it than that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Obviously, the, the challenge of communicating that in an outreach setting is, is, uh, is not trivial. All right, well, thank you very much. <laughs>